There is one major concept concerning the torso that we've not yet addressed head on. It's crucially important to understand that we want the rib cage to be high above the pelvis. Most people keep their rib cage much too low, to the point that their rib cage rests just barely above their pelvis. The reason this happens has to do with the fascia on your back called the thoracolumbar fascia. If we recall what we've learned so far, we know that most people are rotating both their rib cage and their pelvis. The result is a bent torso. When your torso is bent, your torso is shortened. The ends are brought closer together. So your thoracolumbar fascia, which goes up and down the length of your spine, is made slack. When your thoracolumbar fascia is shortened and slack, the front of the body sags forward, and the rib cage as a whole will sag down towards the pelvis. To lengthen the thoracolumbar fascia, we must lengthen the torso. The way to do that is to orient the rib cage and pelvis so that they are both upright, but also we must lift the rib cage up away from the pelvis. The tricky part is that most people's first instinct when attempting to lift their rib cage is to instead pull their rib cage back at the top and to push the bottom of their rib cage forward. We know this will not lead to a desirable orientation of the rib cage. It's exactly what we're trying to avoid. We need to keep the rib cage correctly oriented when lifting it. People will also frequently lift their shoulders when they're asked to lift their rib cage. Lifting the shoulders is simply an error, in that there is no reason to lift the shoulders. Your shoulder girdle sits on top of your rib cage, so lifting your shoulders will not lift your rib cage. Yet it's very common for people to lift their shoulders when they're asked to lift their rib cage. This is a habit that must be anticipated and prevented. There's another kind of pitfall that we must avoid. In trying to orient our rib cage to be upright, we can't go down to accomplish that. Because even if we do manage to get the front of the chest to appear more flat that way, we will have problems in the lower back and elsewhere. So as long as we are not pulling the top of our rib cage back or pushing the lower ribs forward, we should be lifting the rib cage up away from the pelvis as far as we can. The final consideration we will examine today is the back line. As we've seen, most people have a hollowed out lower back. That is, the bend that is caused by their shortened torso. We would instead like to see a back that is flat from just above the glute muscles to the height of the lower sternum. Above that point, the back should curve forward into the neck. We can see that if you were to rotate the bony structures of the torso too much the other way, it would lead to a rounding of the lower back. This is not desirable as the rib cage will be going down in such a case. This is just another way of shortening the torso. You will see people rounding their lower back most commonly when they're sitting or bending down. It seems that we can easily switch between these poor postures, and the reason is that these are the two extremes that are possible when your fascia is limp. We can slump down or arch back, but to pull our fascia into its full length, we have to make different movements than what we are used to. We will have to make movements that we've not made in a long time, if ever. This is why learning to consciously control your torso is so crucial. You won't accidentally move into good posture. You can easily go from one bad extreme to another bad extreme. But we don't need extreme shortening no matter which direction we're shortening in. We need extreme lengthening. For most people, any amount of lengthening will feel extreme at first, because it's so counter to their habits. Lengthening the torso is something to experiment with. You may not be able to get much lift on your first attempts. But don't be afraid to mess up. You can learn from your mistakes. It might surprise you how high you can lift your ribcage up away from your pelvis, but you will never know unless you are willing to try and try again after failing to succeed. The last thing we can recall about this back line is that we want it to be behind our heels, about one fist's distance, so that the weight of the torso can pull the IT band into its full length. 
we now have quite a variety of parameters to consider when attempting to improve the condition of our torso. But we've just been talking about the torso when it's stationary, in sitting or standing. What about when we start to move? What is desirable when moving our torso through space? You have quite a bit of information about the torso already, so think it over. What do you think I will say? What's desirable when moving your torso? Tune into the next episode and join me on another journey.